Um, by the way, if you're new here, I'm Pastor Michael. I'm one of the pastors that's on staff, and our lead pastor, Jeff Carlson, is out on vacation. He's actually with his younger four kids on their, their fall break, and so, yeah, we can clap for that. That's good. Everyone should have a chance to rest. Everyone should have a chance for family, and I'm thankful today that I have the opportunity to speak to you not just because I get to speak and share my heart and what God has given for me, but because it provides Jeff an opportunity to get away with his kids and just be dad. So we're going to continue on in our Unstoppable Church series that's a walk through the book of Acts. Um, if you might, if you've been here for a while, you know that we've been in Acts for, what, two years? And at this rate, we will finish somewhere around 2030, and that's Okay. Uh, but last week, Pastor Jeff spoke about, uh, in Acts 9, how Paul, or Saul, he, he was renamed to Paul, was heading to a city called Damascus, and he was going there to find believers in Christ, people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and he was going to arrest them and bring them back to the chief priests. His goal was murderous and to disrupt the church. That's what he was doing. And on the way there, God showed up in a big way. Bright light knocked him off his horse, and he literally met Jesus on the road. And then he was blind, and they led him by hand. And then there was this guy named Ananias who's like, the Lord said, hey, there's a guy named Paul. I want you to go lay hands on him and pray on him. And Ananias was massively obedient, and he did that, and instantly Paul received his sight again, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where we pick up. So today, we're going to go through Acts 9, the last part of verse 19, all the way through verse 31. So I want everybody stand, because it's really tempting to get quiet. Everybody stand, we're going to read God's Word, and we're going to dive in. So here we pick up here in in verse 19. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them and change the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night by the city gate so they could murder him. But Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers there, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them how Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It always grew in number. These are the very words of God. You may be seated. So as we dive into this passage, I mean, there is a lot going on, and it's choppy, and it's fast, and, and, and man, I could talk about so much, it, but, but honestly, it marks one of the most significant turning points in the New Testament. It, it illustrates Paul's profound change from a persecutor of Christians to one of its most fervent evangelist, and eventually one of the the greatest apostles of the church. This section of scripture highlights not only Paul's personal transformation, but also broader themes of, of grace, of mission, about 
the church's response to radical change in people and the power of a faithful friend. And so I really want to quickly cover some of those themes inside this passage, but then I'm going to pivot to what God has really laid on my heart today. So we're going to chat, and then we're going to really talk. So let's chat about grace. The theme of grace, it it permeates every aspect of Paul's transformation and the events here in Acts 9, 20 through 31. It's by God's grace that Paul is saved. He's called and he's empowered for ministry. But grace also works through the community, allowing them to forgive Paul's past and accept him as one of their own. And finally, to co-labor with him. That grace, it strengthens the church leading to peace and growth. It it helps people get out, the flesh get out of the way of the leading of the Holy Spirit. This powerful, powerful passage demonstrates that grace is not just about individual salvation, but about transformation, about empowerment, reconciliation, and building up the entire body of Christ. If you remember our five solas series earlier in this year, sola gratia, by grace alone. quiet. Let's talk about mission. The theme of mission, it's woven throughout this passage too. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, we can see it in Paul's personal transformation, his newfound bold proclamation of the gospel, but also in the role of the Christian community in, in the broader growth of the church. Paul's mission is divinely ordained. It's fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit and supported By a community of believers. Here's the point. This passage illustrates that mission is central to the Christian faith. Compelling believers to boldly proclaim the gospel despite opposition. It also shows that mission is a shared responsibility. It's shared with the entire church playing a role in supporting and advancing the message of Christ. We're all called to mission. Everyone who hears is called to mission. Good preaching, Michael. Okay. Let's chat about the community's response to radical change. It's not lost on me that it would be really, really hard to accept someone like Paul in an instant, like, Hey, I'm saved. I'm different now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Are you tricking me? Do you really just want to arrest me? Are you a spy? Are you trying to get in here? It's human nature. It's human nature to be skeptical. And even the memory that God gave us gets in the way of our ability to have faith and hope for a different future for someone than their past would say. It's not lost on me. But we individually and as a church have a responsibility to expect, expect radical change of lives, not just of others, but even ourselves. Initially, the Christian church, well, they were fearful fearful and suspicious that Paul was a spy because of his violent past. But through Barnabas' mediation and the power of God's grace, They came to accept and support him. That community embrace, well, it eventually, it led to a willingness to protect him in his mission, even at their own peril. So if the Jews wanted to kill Paul, and you're one of the guys helping to secret him out of the city in a basket, you'd be putting yourself in in risk, right? Right? They embraced his change, and that got them to the point where they would do that for him. This illustrates some broader values of faith and grace and unity and showing that the church thrives when it is open to radical transformation brought by the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. So quiet. All right, let's chat about the power of a faithful friend. I know I'm busting through these. I can't leave it not said. I love to study and I love to pull things together. And I promise I'll make this one quick and then we'll really dive in. 
So we just talked about how the early church wasn't ready to immediately accept Paul as one of their own, let alone co-labor with him. But he had an advocate and a mediator. Of course, we always have Jesus at the right side of the Lord advocating, praying for us. But he had a human advocate, a human mediator, a mentor to go with him, a witness to his transformation. Barnabas plays a crucial role in this passage, serving as someone who helps bridge the gap between Paul, formerly Saul, and the early church. His importance, it lies in that role as mediator, encourager, advocate, disciple maker, friend. He ensured that Paul's radical transformation is accepted and that Paul could begin his mission in the church. Barnabas' actions have far-reaching implications for the early church and for the church today, showing just how one's, one person's willingness to stand with someone, the impact that it can have in the gospel. I'd hazard a guess that if it wasn't for Barnabas, we might not have had Paul's success or a different level of success. And I would say even that in the column of victories, every success that Paul had moving forward, Barnabas, as Jeff said last week, gets an asterisk. He was involved in that too. There's power. There's power in the church together. There's power in encouraging. There's power in discipling and bringing others up and releasing them into their call. There's power in a faithful friend. Okay. So I promise I'm going to get you out of here on time. But I have literally got 17 or 19 pages of working notes in another document. Not this one. Don't worry. For all of the things that God really just has opened my heart and mind to in this passage over the years. But as I was preparing the sermon for today, you know, the Lord really, he really just laid on my heart a false narrative that he, he wanted to address. And at first I'm like, okay. Lord, open my eyes to who that person is. Let me pray for them. But the more I prayed and the more I thought about it and the more I just sat with God thinking about this, the more he showed me that it's, it's actually for all of us that's listening. And anybody listening online, that this, this false narrative, it, it needs to be corrected. And, and so here we go. It's really, really, really easy to read through this passage of Scripture or even the passage of Scripture right before it with Ananias being so boldly obedient and to put Paul and, and Barnabas and Ananias up on a pedestal and be like, yeah, well, you know, okay, these are like biblical figures, you know, like, of, of course, they were incredible. And I'll never have impact like that. Worse yet, Thinking that and believing it and being okay with it. See, that's a false narrative. It's literally giving up before you give God a chance to work in and through you. Our words, our thoughts have power. They can make a statement of faith. Lord, you are God. Your son came to earth lived, died, and rose again for my salvation. That's a statement of faith. So is, I will never be. So as much as faith can lead to action, a lack of faith can lead to inaction. So what's the true narrative that we learn directly from Paul in his later writings throughout the New Testament, his, his letters to the early church, he was just a man who God transformed mightily, 
who God worked in and through. Saul was transformed initially by literally meeting Jesus, the very one he was opposed. He was opposed to on that road to Damascus. He went from murderous rampage, right? To making sure that everyone could hear the truth and experience God's love in a matter of days. But yet, he remained a work in progress. Later, he lamented that his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. He did what he didn't want to do and didn't do what he wanted or knew he should do. In all, though, he was being transformed. He was just a man who was and continued to be transformed. He's just a person like everyone in this room, including myself, whom God can work in and through to the end of transformation. So it begs a couple questions. What is transformation? And why was Paul so radically and wildly effective for the gospel? So, hope you're taking notes. You got some fill in the blanks. I hope to answer them so you can actually fill something in there, but please write down what the Lord is speaking to you as well. Transformation, it's defined as a dramatic change in form or, or appearance. From a biblical perspective, it's a replacement of character. See, your actions reveal your character. That's, that's not a biblical statement. That's just something that I, I have learned that uh, what you do, your words come out of the fullness of your heart. Your actions reveal the character that lives inside of you. And so transformation from a biblical perspective is the replacement of my fleshly, earthly character to the point where my actions now reveal more and more the character of Christ. We see this in Paul. See, his earlier actions... They revealed a character that was strictly against Christ. He was going after the church. He wanted to shut it down. And then his character changed to revealing that the character of Christ. His actions showed his faith, his new character, his new heart, his new mind by making sure everyone could hear the truth and experience God's love. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a nerd. I know, big shocker. Big shocker. I'm a technology guy. I'm, I'm actually, you know, like certified in forensic investigation and analysis. I've worked in the intelligence community. I, I've got a degree in liberal arts and sociology, so I'm a scientist too. And so uh, analysis and math really helps me make sense of things. I know, Sunday morning, didn't think we are going to do math, but we're going to do some math. Why? Because I want to help everyone wrap their minds around some of the parts of transformation. Now, this is just something that I've gotten put together. It helps me make sense of it. Remember, this is just for illustration. So transformation is, let's throw that up there. Transformation equals the quantity inspiration plus information times application. You know, everybody remember, you know, basic algebra, PEMDAS. You know, you got to do the stuff inside the parentheses first, and then you do, well, okay, I'll not be a nerd anymore. Let's talk about the parts of this equation. So inspiration for every believer it comes initially through salvation and is then ever fueled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is in guaranteed encounters with God, sitting in his presence, in worship, in reading and studying the Bible. That might be exactly why we encourage you to have a strong devotional life. Little plug there. The information part of this equation, extra biblical books and, and teaching, or just even noticing how broken I am or we are, or how the world behaves towards each other so terribly, but I would venture a guess that sometimes even the Bible itself can be just information. 
Be honest with me. Be honest. I, like, be bold, be honest. Raise your hand if there are still parts of the Bible that you read and you struggle to understand. Okay, those of you that didn't raise your hand maybe need to read some more. <laughs> or I want to sit down with you and really talk because I've got some questions. But here's the reality. The Bible itself can be information. And this is important to answering the question why Paul was so wildly effective. But God is faithful to unlock truths. I know even in my own personal walk with the Lord, years and years ago, the Holy Spirit dropped in my mind, Michael, what is love? Actually, he started with what is truth. <laughs> Oof. And I dove into the Word and I read sections of the Bible that I had read time and time and time again and all of a sudden, the Lord made it alive. He unlocked truth. It was that moment of inspiration where the information combined. And finally, there's application. Now, again, I'm doing math to prove a point here. What is the result when you multiply any number by zero? Great, you guys paid attention. Yes, you get an A for today. Simply put, application is living out the consequence, the reality of that inspiration and, insp and information combined. If we come to church and we worship and we pray and we read our Bible, but it does not change the way we live our life, we have no transformation. Make sense? We have to live it out. It has to change the way we live. It has to really change our character. And let's go back to the very beginning where I was saying that it's a change of character. And what reveals character are actions. So why was Paul so wildly successful? Well, we read in one of his letters that Paul was a, a true citizen of Israel. He was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a, a Hebrew, Hebrew if there ever was a Hebrew. And he was a member of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, by the way, were like super hyper, like they knew every last jot and tittle, that's actually like real words, about all the nuances about the entire law of God. To do that... As a young Jewish boy, he likely had to memorize the entire Pentateuch, or the, the first five books of the Bible, like memorize it and be able to speak it out. He knew God's word. In fact, as a Jew in this time, he would have been waiting for a Messiah. He would have known about the concept of a coming Messiah, a Savior. And, and as we see through the Gospels, a lot of people got it wrong what the Messiah was going to do. But they were waiting. They're in this period where the prophets haven't spoken for a really long time and they're living and they know all this information. But man, the moment that combined with inspiration, God unlocked every bit of that truth. And suddenly, none of the other Jews could refute his proofs that Jesus was the Messiah. He lived it out. It changed him in an instant. But it continued to change. Because when we read, even just in this small section of Scripture, we see that his preaching got bolder and stronger. And as you follow Paul through all of his letters and through the end of his life, you can see how he changes from on fire, and I don't want anything to do with John Mark as he took off to us to, hey, send him back, he's useful. He's my brother, I love him. To sitting in chains and winning Roman guard after Roman guard to salvation, waiting for death. He was transformed. And that's a fantastic story, and that's where it's really easy to like, whoop, pedestal, that's Paul, here's me, ha. Huh? I won't, I, won't, I won't do that, but that's that false narrative. We have to correct that because transformation is available. It's available for everyone through the same power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit today. A transformation from 
I once was, but I now am. This, my friends, it's your testimony. And it awaits. It's available for everyone because transformation is desired by God. I mentioned that inspiration part of transformation, it begins initially for every believer at salvation. Remember the moment you accepted the Lord. You could feel something, and you knew it was different. That was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at that salvation moment. He was there. It began to change you. Well, that right and saving relationship with Jesus and salvation, we begin, and, and we know Paul, in his writing later, we know it's desired by God. When he wrote to Timothy, he said, to pray for all people, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give them thanks, or give thanks for them. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God, one mediator who can reconcile God with humanity. The man, Jesus Christ, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Transformation is available. It's available, not just salvation, but transformation is available for everyone and desired by God. He desires all people to be saved. He wants everyone to live in right relationship with him and to understand his truth. And as we understand truth, as he unlocks truth, and we apply his truth to our lives and through our lives, we are transformed. It's a supernatural understanding, a renewing of our mind through the Holy Spirit. It will change the way we think, and our thoughts lead to action, and those thoughts can either lead to sin and death or life. Understanding his truth, that transformation allows us to be transformed and have life. Not only is it desired, transformation desired, transformation ongoing is expected for a maturing follower of Jesus. Now, stopping at salvation, that, that initial part of transformation into the character of Christ is, it's unacceptable. Stopping right there, being done, cashing out. I'm good. I got my get out of hell free card. It's not good enough. Transformation does take a lifetime. But no progress beyond that initial moment of salvation does no good for the gospel. To have been bought for a price, but then to yield no result for the kingdom, well, it makes you a bad investment. Think about that. It's also giving up the extraordinary story that God wants and so strongly desires to write with your life. Here's what the writer of Hebrews had to say. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through the training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. We even read in Romans 12 a warning. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by the changing of the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let God transform you. Why? So that you will know God's will for you. And if you know it, you can do it by the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit. This is why we encourage you to engage in a strong devotional life. You experience God in his word and in prayer. 
It's exactly why we facilitate life groups. You experience God engaging his word and what he's saying to you in community of believers. It's why we have extra events like passionate core prayer. So you can join together in the community of Christ to pray God's will for this church. Not a dishwasher prayer, Lord, my dishwasher's broke and my budget is flat. But to pray for God's will to be done in this church. That's what we do at 9 a.m. on Sundays. That's why we have Tim Inlow coming. To help us learn about the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is available. And if you have questions or if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit or if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and still don't understand it. Or if you're just hearing my voice, show up this weekend for Tim Enlow. It'll be good for you. I promise. That's why we have global prayer nights. So that we can hear about the mission throughout the world. So that we can pray fervently for those that we have sent and are sending. And some of you can be called to go. It's even why we record podcasts. These things, all this community, the teaching, the events, the gatherings are to help you to dig into the true nature of God. To engage in his presence and to hear truth. It wasn't about Paul in the scripture, he was just a man that God worked in and through. It's not about me standing up here, one iota. I don't matter. What matters is God in me and through me. I really wish I could have just played bass today and hidden in the back. I don't actually like standing in front of a a bunch of people, but God laid this on my heart to share. You need to hear, it doesn't matter. Years ago, and I've shared this, this example before, and I'm just, I'm, I'm struck to give it again. I was studying, and, and the Lord sometimes drops illustrations or words or pictures in my mind and on my heart, and I just pray through them, and the Lord just reveals stuff to me, kind of that unlocking truth. And, and, and so he gave me the word pencil, but in German, because I speak German, it's a long story. But he's a Schreiber, and I was like, Are you okay? You know, I'm literally reading in John 15 then, and I'm like, pencil, right on, God. And I wrote it down in my journal, and I just wouldn't go away and go away. <sighs> so I, I, I relented to it, and I just started to pray. I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? I said, Michael, you're the pencil, I'm the author. I'm not writing a story for your life. No. I want to pick you up. I want to write my story with your life. And that's not about me. That's for you. Collectively, we are a box of Ticonderoga number two pencils, the best ones. That God wants to pick up and write his story with our lives, but that does not happen unless we engage in his presence and the transformation that comes through it. If we do not yield our lives and every bit of our thought, our time, even our finances, to him, to use, to retool, and to write his story. But I'm weak, I'm tired, I'm busy, I'm just, I'm only, I'm addicted, I'm confused about my sexuality. I can't change. These are all excuses. As a pastor, we get to hear all the time. And in fact, sometimes we say it too. I'll be honest. There are times when it's like, oh, Lord, I'm so busy. Uh, and he's like, well, okay. You can either trust in supernatural results and sit with me, or you can try to do it yourself. Side note. The reality is all that is horse feathers, If you are in Christ, the old is past, and you are a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a child of the Most High God. Inside of you, His Holy Spirit dwells, and you live in His unshakable kingdom. So you might truly be weak or tired. You surely are busy and probably limited in what you can do, but... In Christ, a new beginning 
is sprouted. The transformation has begun. And the tr- power to continue and complete that transformation lives inside of you. And we serve a God who is faithful to complete the work that he began in you. I know this to be true. But we have to engage. We have to decide. The writer of Galatians puts it pretty well. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Instead of using I'm human as an excuse to walk in your flesh and continue to trip, how about we try using I'm saved as a reason to walk intentionally in the Spirit. Well, what does all this really matter? Again, it's not about me. It wasn't about Paul. It's not even really about you. You see, transformation leads to greater impact for the gospel. God desires that all are saved and that all know the truth, that they get to experience his love and right relationship with him. Can you imagine with me if we were living, everyone living, ever transformed lives, revealing more and more every day the character of Christ? Not only in our actions, but in our thoughts, even our words. Think with me for just a moment what it would look like in your home, your work, your neighborhood, Gator Lafayette, and beyond. Now, I know not all of you have gone down this hallway right outside that wall. But on that wall, there's there's a listing of every unreached people group in the entire world. Unreached means that there is no Christian community inside it. There is no one there to share the gospel, to share God's love with them. 3.2, 3.4 billion people. That means that they will be born, live, and die And never hear a message like this or anything about God's love. I just asked you to think about what it would look like if we live transformed lives. I can tell you what it looks like because we're not. That hallway doesn't have a lot of those people groups marked off. And I'll be frank, to get marked off, to get a red line put over it, it's really only like 2.5% of the population is now Christian. That, that there's a church, an indigenous church, that can support the gospel. 2.5%. What's 2.5% of 31 million people in a people group? So let me ask again, what does it look like if we all individually lived transformed lives, if we banded together one another in community to ensure that we transformed and exhibited Christ in our character. Because I can tell you what it looks like because we're not. And it looks a lot like that hallway. So the worship band came back up. They're going to start playing and I'm going to wrap up and we're going to be done. And I'll be honest, I'm not going to close this service really in a traditional way Um, but as they start to play some folks here today well they may have heard me speaking and this is the first time that you've ever heard that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that he desires to provide salvation for your right relationship with God so I want everybody stand up If that's you, and you're like, man, this guy's got something and I want it. You feel something in your heart. It's like, wow, 
I, I know I need something, or you know directly, I, I need salvation. If that's you, it's really simple. Paul didn't do anything special or to deserve Jesus to show up on the road. And you don't have to do anything special for Jesus to show up in your life and to be your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Right where you stand, every eye closed, every head bowed, right where you stand. If that's you today and you want to accept the Lord as your Savior, say that simple prayer. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. I'm going to ask you to be bold. Everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed. If you said that for the first time or for the 31st time, I want you to raise your hand. And and I I don't ask that because we want to make a count. I ask that because we need to do this in community. You need an advocate. You need a mediator. You need a mentor. They can walk with you. For the rest of you, it's a pretty challenging thing to to stand in front of Scripture and realize that that story about Paul or that story about Barnabas or the story about the believers that lowered Paul down in a basket. Well, that that could be about you. See, God ordained good works for you already. He's waiting for you. But I'm going to tell you, they're going to they're going to take more of him. More of him in your life, in your heart, in your mind, a renewing of your mind. And all those things that I said earlier, maybe you are addicted. Maybe you have wrong priorities for your schedule for your money or even if you're confused about your identity it needs to be transformed so in these closing minutes I I just want to ask two things one right where you stand or at the altar to begin to surrender to the Lord You might not have an easy answer of what needs to be transformed in your life, what needs to be made more like Christ. But as we sang the song in Defender, we're going to sing it again here. The band's going to play it. You know before I do where my heart can find truth. So if you will take just the next few minutes to pray and ask the Lord to reveal to you where he wants to work next. What things in your life don't reflect him that he wants to pull out and replace with himself? The second ask is this. Transformation requires application. There's two responses to God's truth. There's the private response and the public response. And the private response is just surrendering to his presence. So I'm going to open up the altar. We're just going to stand and we're going to worship as an opportunity to sit in God's presence. Because he'll meet you in that prayer and in his presence in this time. And continue that work of transformation that he promises to complete in you. So today we're not going to close like normal. I'm not going to dismiss you. We're just going to hang out as long as we need to. Band's going to play. Take a moment to pray. And let's worship. You can come to the altar. You can stay in your seat. But let's enjoy his presence.